Okay, welcome back to our course on the letter to the Galatian by St. Paul. And we have thus far worked through uh, chapter 1, verses 1 through 17. In this session, we're going to start by looking at verses 18 in chapter 1 and following. And really from 118 to 210 in the letter to the Galatians forms a liter literary unit that we can look at. And so we'll split that up into two uh, by looking at 118 to 24 here in this first session, and the next time we'll look at 2, 1 through 10. Um, and these two sections really uh, talk about Paul's visit, uh, his first and second visit to Jerusalem, um, which is significant because Paul, as we will uh, start to see, he's trying to navigate a tension between, um, on the one hand, emphasizing that he receives his gospel and apostleship from directly from God, but on the other hand that, you know, and with that it's not from man or any other uh, person, but on the other hand that he's also not just going rogue, that he is, uh, ha he's in agreement with the other apostles. And so he has to try to navigate that tension and he's also trying to put out some fires as well. Um, okay, so we'll look at verses 18 through 24. Before we do, let's just quick look at uh, verses 11 and 12 and remind ourselves, this is again, I would take it as Paul's thesis for his whole letter. Um, and it's from 11 and 12 then that verses 13 and following, he begins the work out in his own experience. And then as we'll see in these next two sections of his, um, his own uh, recalling of his this narrative sequence of what took place after he encountered Jesus. Um, verses 11, he says that the gospel preached by me is not according to man. So remember, this is not a message that is going to fit into any human category. It's not going to appease human thinking It's because it's not from human beings. Humans would not invent the message of a gospel of a crucified Messiah. That's just not something we would invent. Um, and so for Paul, he did not receive it, he says, from man, nor was he taught it, but instead it came by revelation of Jesus Christ. And so he emphasizes this term apocalypse or revelation, um, which is he, he, when he gets the gospel, not when Jesus reveals the gospel to him, but he gets the gospel when Jesus reveals himself to him. Um, and we pointed out that out in the last time. And so again, apocalypse is not something that is you know, end of the world, destruction of everything type thing. It's an unveiling, it's a disclosure. And so he says it's through this divine disclosure of Jesus Christ that he gets his gospel and also his apostleship, which is what he begins Galatians with in uh, verse one. Not from man nor through the agency of man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. And so Paul's going to be continuing that thought of his apostleship and his gospel, which derives from a divine origin, not a human origin. Um, and it's that very commissioning that he has and the message which he's commissioned with. Um, he's not serving a human institution as, again, he calls himself a slave of the Messiah. His allegiance is to Jesus. It's not to any human being or a human institution. And so this is Paul's swagger. This is his uh, confidence. And sometimes it almost borders on arrogance. But really what he's trying to do, especially in the letter to the Galatians, is he's trying to get them to not turn away to this pseudo gospel of the teachers that had come in and were challenging Paul's apostleship and message. He's trying to bring them back into his gospel because his gospel is not something he invented or something he uh, added to. He gets it directly from Revelation. And so he he serves Jesus and his allegiance is to Jesus alone. And so his gospel is the gospel of grace and gospel of freedom, um, which he gets directly from Jesus. And so he's trying to get the, the Galatians to come back to this and not be lured away by the pseudo gospel. Um and so he's going to be working this out in the rest of chapter one. He's still affirming his apostleship and his message, not from man, but through instead from God and through revelation of Jesus Christ. He begins by showing his former manner of life and how he used to persecute the church of God, even trying to destroy it. Um, 
And he talks about how he was zealous for the ancestral customs in advancing in Judaism. Again, these are not referring to uh, the ancestral traditions. It's not referring to, you know, even their scriptures. It's likely referring to the Pharisaic school and interpretation of the scriptures. And, and Judaism was likely referring to that way of life as a Pharisee that was so intense of trying to uh, pressure the insider, insider Jews to uh, get in line and to uh, keep keep up with purity laws and obeying the Torah and all that th stuff because they saw that as tied to God's eschatological activity, meaning God was going to act to rescue Israel if they were keeping in step with doing all these things and Torah observance. And also they were uh, very zealous to um, protect Israel from any um, possible external pagan corruption or influence. And so that was Paul's former manner of life. But when God, he says, who revealed his son in me, right? So he then, God interrupts him and uh, radically reorients his whole life through the revelation of his son in Paul. And so this is what then redirects Paul. And this is, it's the revelation of Jesus Christ for Paul that on the one hand, it shatters all of his understandings of the God of Israel, God's purpose through Israel. God's activity in the world and his own purpose. It's all shattered in light of the revelation of Jesus Christ. Yet at the same time, it is radically reconstructed by that revelation. That Paul not only sees uh, Jesus as uh, reorienting Israel's history, but he sees Jesus as fulfilling Israel's history in a way that was least expected by anybody. Nobody expected and anticipated a crucified Messiah. And so um, for Paul, he sees Israel's history coming to its completion in Jesus and especially his crucifixion and resurrection. But also he sees uh, Israel's very destiny and vocation taken up and to be a light to the nations. And he himself is caught up as he says that he revealed, he apocalypsed his son in me that I might preach him among the nations. And so Paul sees himself as caught up as a one who's um, a slave of the Messiah, he's caught up in Israel's history because he is at a point in history in which the present evil age has been broken and overcome and the new age of God's new creation has already been inaugurated um, through the gift of the Spirit and in the crucified Jesus. And so now Paul is living out of that new commission. Um, and he goes on to preach that Jesus is Lord of the world and he's Israel's Messiah. Um, and then he goes on to say, as we pointed out in the last part of last session, that he emphasizes what he did not immediately do after this encounter. One, he did not consult with flesh and blood, right? A, a way of speaking of corruptible mortal humanity. So he does not immediately consult with flesh and blood, nor does he say he goes to Jerusalem, which is the headquarters of the early church, Um we could think of it as sort of the mother church. He says he does not go to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, right? So he's trying to, to, as we move into verse 18 and following, he is trying to, on the one hand, um, put out fires by these accusations he's receiving um, from the teachers that were disturbing the Galatians. On the one hand, he's trying to create distance from himself and the Jerusalem apostles, because likely these accusations were from these teachers that Paul was dependent and even subordinate to the apostles of Jerusalem um, for his gospel. But now he's deviated from that gospel, which the apostles originally taught him. He's, he's kind of off being a rogue apostle doing his own thing. Um, and so... That's likely what's going on because now he's, you know, saying that the Gentiles can come in on just basically free grace and they don't have to become Jewish by circumcision or observing the Jewish way of life or obedience to the Torah and whatnot. Um, and so they're saying, you know, Paul's preaching a watered down gospel. Um, he's not in alignment with the apostles of Jerusalem. And so on the one hand, Paul is trying to create distance from the Jerusalem church. But on the other hand, he's trying to show he's actually in agreement with them, that they preach the same Jesus, that they actually approve of his message, um, but he in no way needs their approval because his confidence rests upon his encounter with Jesus, not another apostle. Even if it is St. Peter or St. James or whoever it was, 
and, and the high honor and status they had in the early church, he doesn't need their approval, but he has it. And so he's navigating this tension where he's, through verse 18 and following, we'll see that he's on the one hand creating an independence from Jerusalem apostles, yet at the same time he's showing he's in agreement with them. And again, he's going back to verse 1 and verse 11 and 12. He's affirming that his apostleship, his message throughout, as we look at this, um, is from God, not from man. And that's where his confidence lies. Um, and so verse 18, he says, then, three years later. So this word then is used. Um, he also uses that same word in verse 21. Then I went to the regions of Syria and Cilicia. And in verse 2, or sorry, verse um, 1 of chapter 2, then after an interval of 14 years. Um, so this key term then uh, sort of helps us split up this literary unit into three sections. Of uh, this, this tells us of the sequence of events that Paul is going to lay out here. And uh, we had kind of briefly touched on this, but as we talk about these events, and really we're talking about the historical narrative of what Paul is saying, um, it is very challenging because we, in order to reconstruct the historical um, biography of Paul, all we have in specifically what we're doing now is the letter of Galatians here and also the book of Acts. That's what we have to reconstruct historically how, you know, Paul's history works. With that said, the letter to the Galatians is written by Paul with an with an apologetic agenda. He's trying to defend his apostleship, his gospel, with a specific intent on the people to, in the regions of Galatia, right? Whereas the book of Acts, written by Luke, um, as a sequel to uh, the gospel of Luke, is written with a different agenda, with a different perspective, to different audience. Um, and so with that said, you're going to have a bit of difference in some of the, the nitty-gritty details of even Paul's, you know, history. Um, and so sometimes scholars wrestle with this, and there's different views of how to line it up. And we'll see, especially in chapter 2, um, verses 1 through 10, what that meeting in Jerusalem is referring to. And there's a couple different views of whether it's referring to Acts 11 or Acts 9, or sorry, Acts 15. But the point is, is that... It's very difficult to nail down because some of the nitty-gritty details are, are, are different. And you would expect that because Paul did not sit down with Luke as Paul was writing Galatians and Luke was going to write Acts. And they didn't sit down and have a conference and say, okay, let's make sure our details of our stories line up. They, they didn't do that. Um, and so there was two different agendas, two different authors, two different audiences. We just need to remember that. And so likely we're not going to have a nice, neat little... Um, historical sequence, because there's always going to be a verse here or there that we're going to struggle with and try to figure out how does that fit in. And again, just to reiterate, it's just a bit difficult. Um, so Paul says three years later, uh, likely he's referring to three years after he encounters Jesus. Three years later, he says, um, remember, he does not immediately go to Jerusalem to consult with the apostles, because again, he's trying to uh, draw the Galatians' confidence of his apostleship and gospel on his own encounter with Jesus, not getting it from the apostles as a second-rate or second-hand um, thing. But then he's reluctant and honest to admit, but, you know, at three years afterwards, I did actually go to Jerusalem. Um, and he says he goes to be acquainted with Cephas and stay with him 15 days. Verse 19, he says, I did not see any of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. Now in what I'm writing to you, I assure you before God that I am not lying. Then I went into the regions of Syria and Cilicia, and I was unknown by sight to the churches of Judea who were in Christ. But only they kept hearing, he who once persecuted us is now preaching the faith which he once tried to destroy. And they were glorifying God because of me. So um, again, he's drawing out a sequence of the events after his um, encounter with Jesus and his uh, subsequent transformation and then what that led him to do. Not immediately go consult with a human being, not immediately go get his message lined out with the apostles, but instead he, from verse 17, he went away to Arabia and then later on returned to Damascus. But he's reluctant and honest to say, I did go to Jerusalem to be acquainted with Cephas um, and stayed with him 15 days. 
So this verb here, um, where he says to become acquainted with Cephas, some uh, translations will say to visit Cephas or to get to know Cephas. Um, and there are some connotations here of this verb that it could have uh, possible connotations of that Paul was getting information. Um, and some might even say to get information about Jesus from Peter. But the context of this verb really helps us to know that he's not getting information about Jesus from Peter. Um, instead, this verb is that he's getting information about Peter and Peter's story and Peter's uh, encounter with Jesus. And he's simply just getting to know Peter. He's uh, visiting Peter. It's a casual visit. It's not some official council of the leadership of Jerusalem and, you know, Peter, James, and John and all the apostles calling him to Jerusalem to square him away. Um, it's a more of a casual visit where he just hangs out, gets to know him, and they talk about Jesus, no doubt. I mean, you can imagine the two big dogs, St. Paul and St. Peter, talking about Jesus for a couple weeks. That would be pretty incredible to, to eavesdrop in on of what they talked about. Um, but the main point here is that Paul does not go visit uh, Cephas to get the gospel from him. Remember, he gets the gospel from, from God himself, from uh, the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's where he gets the gospel. That's where his confidence is. Um, if, if anything he learns about Jesus from, from Peter, it's only a um, secondary affirmation of what he already knows from the revelation of Jesus personally and directly to himself. Um, and so Peter and, and Paul, these are the two main figures of the early church, especially in the book of Acts. The first part of the book of Acts, you'll see it tracing the ministry of Peter. And then the second part of the book of Acts, you'll see it tracing the ministry through Paul. Um, and these are the two, really the two heads of the church of God's activity to the Jews through Peter and to the Gentiles through Paul. Um, it's one gospel, one God, one mission, um, but it's two different directions and two different spheres of influence, particularly through these two apostles. And so that's a huge uh, thing that Paul's bringing up here to try to unify uh, the Galatians' understanding that it's not two different messages, it's not two different apostleships, um, it's, it's one. He says that he did not see any of the other apostles. Again, emphasizing this is not probably an official visit, right? This is a casual visit because he didn't see any of the other apostles except for James, the Lord's brother. Um, as it says, this is an explicit reference of this is Jesus' brother, James. Um, there's a couple other James in uh, the Gospels. You'll see James, the son of Zebedee, James, the son of Alphaeus. They are different. This is James, the brother of Jesus. And this James was um, martyred in 62 AD, they say, because he was one of the leaders, the most prominent leader of the Jerusalem church. As things began to expand and the apostles went their different ways, James was, uh, he was sort of the, the first leader and the main guy at the Jerusalem church. And so he likely carried high esteem for many of the Jewish believers, especially these teachers who were uh, creating a disturbance in Galatia and opposing Paul, likely for them to hear James name dropped and the Galatians to hear the name of James name dropped. That was a very key thing. Um, so James, the Lord's brother. So he just sees Cephas and James, the Lord's brother for a few weeks. Verse 20, he says, I'm in what I'm writing to you. I assure you before God, I am not lying. So he has to emphasize and almost take an oath in a similar way He'll do this at, at various occasions throughout his, throughout his letter. But why would he be doing that? Why would he have to emphasize the fact that he's not lying? This uh, verse 20 is probably the first indicator we have of that, that Paul is putting out fires and he's responding to specific allegations by the teachers. That he is um, saying that he's not lying because he did go to Jerusalem he did see Peter, he did see James, but he did not get the gospel from them. If anything, his gospel he already received from Revelation was confirmed in these meetings and, you know, he had more confidence in it, but he did not, this is not where he, where he got it. Um, so he's clarifying his end of the story, trying to show the Galatians that he did go to Jerusalem, but it was not to um, be some subservient student of these apostles because he sees himself as equal with them. Uh, 
He goes on in verse 21 to say, I went into the regions of Syria and Cilicia. This is very difficult to know exactly what he does here. We don't really know. Um, but the regions of Syria and Cilicia, we know, um, is the territories of Antioch, which was the home base for Paul's mission. Um, him and Barmas, that was the home base for them for a while. And then also Tarsus, uh, that's where Tarsus was located, which is his hometown. And so not sure exactly, according to this passage, what he does there. It's a lot is left up to conjecture. Um, Verse 22, he says, I was still unknown by sight to the churches of Judea, which were in Christ. Um, this phrase, I was unknown by face, is the literal rendering of it. I was unknown by face. It's just a way of saying that the churches had not seen him personally yet. Um, it's just a way of speaking that they had not seen him face to face, had not um, had the personal encounter with Paul yet. They were only hearing of what happened with Paul. That's all that was happening with them. Um, he says, the churches of Judea, which were in Christ, in Christo. This phrase is probably the most important phrase in all of Paul's writings. Um, this is uh, Paul's favorite formula in used in, in several variations in his writings. Um, you'll see the variations of in him or in whom or in the Lord, or in Christ Jesus. Um, this phrase, in Christo, in Christ, is very central for Paul. Um, and, and many have said, if we want to understand Paul, you simply just need to understand in Christ. It speaks of union with Christ. It speaks of um, our incorporation into Christ. It speaks of our living and abiding reality of, of deriving our um, all of our sustenance and who we are and uh, salvation from Christ because we're in Christ. Um, so he says that the churches of Judea, which were in Christ. So this is the first time this phrase in Christo comes up in Galatians. We will see it again in verse two, four, where he says, um, there are some who have been brought in, who snuck in to spy out our freedom, which we have in Christ. Christ Jesus, so the freedom which we have in Christ Jesus, um, to, uh, let's see, it's 2.17, I believe, yeah, so 2.17, he says, if while we were seeking to be justified in Christ, that's a very important verse, a part of that next section we'll look at in a few sessions, which is packed with all sorts of debate and theology. But anyway, he says, seeking to be justified in Christ. Seeking to be justified in Christ. That's a big phrase. Um, 314, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, in order that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we would receive the promise of the Spirit through faith, right? So in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham comes to the nations, um, that's an important one. Um, 326, for you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. 28, neither Jew nor Greek, neither slave nor free, neither male nor female. You are all one in Christ Jesus. Um, verse 6 of chapter 5. Uh, for in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything but faith working through love. Uh, verse 10, a variation in the Lord. Okay, so you see, you see that phrase throughout Galatians, and it's, it's everywhere in Galatians. Um, and it's very central for understanding Paul. Um, if, especially if you read a book, uh, the letter to Ephesians, for example, it is, it's huge in the letter to Ephesians. You'll see it everywhere. Um, I think it's, you know, over 40 times, I think, in Ephesians or something like that. It's a lot. Um, and so this phrase is, is, is the heart of Paul's theology. It's the heart of his ethics. It's the heart of everything for him. Um, he lives, he thinks, and he breathes in Christo. The point of reference for all of his thought is in Christo. Um, Christ, which is Messiah or anointed one, the, the Greek term Christos. Uh, we've talked about this before, but this is important to know that this is not the last name um, that appears after Jesus on his birth certificate, right? This is uh, 
This is not really even referring to a proper name, um, especially early on. This was uh, later on, perhaps, was developed into a proper name, Jesus Christ. But early on, this was, in, in Judaism, uh, likely a title of an office, um, the Anointed One, the Messiah. That is, um, the, the, the coming royal figure who would be from the line of David, who would fulfill the hopes of Israel, who would bring God's power and kingship into the world, the Messiah. Um, that was the, the Jewish hope, and, and the, it was... Um, not explicit in many texts, but it developed throughout Israel's history and became more and more explicit with their eschatological hopes, meaning the, the day when God would act to rescue them from their enemies, to um, make a new covenant, to redeem them from exile, to um, establish his rule and justice and peace in the world. Um, the Messiah figure was very central to that activity of God, that he would be the anointed one, meaning he was set apart in service of God. He would be the agent through which God's rule, uh, God's kingdom would come into the world and be established. Um, what's, what else is interesting about the term Christos, Messiah, it's a representative and incorporative figure, uh, meaning that what is true of the Messiah is true of the people. Um, and you see this in uh, when David defeats Goliath, um, when David defeats Goliath, it's David who wins the victory, but in it's also Israel who gets the victory because Israel is seen as in David. So they share in his victory. They share in the benefits of what he wins for them. Um, and so it is with Christ. What is true of him is true of his people. Um, but it's it's so dramatic that that the Messiah was seen by many as the one in whom all of Israel is summed up, that the whole of Israel was summed up in the Messiah. You could even say that the Messiah was Israel in person, um, that the Messiah was the one in whom Israel's very purpose and destiny was fulfilled, that Israel's vocation was completed in the Messiah. Um, so the Messiah became a very, very huge um, conversation of, of who this figure would be and what they would do. Um, and so in Christ has roots in a lot of that, that language of Paul in Christ. Um, what is true of him is also true of those who he represents. Paul will also use language of things like in the spirit, or he will uh, set that in juxtaposition with in the flesh. Um, and so again, those are just you know two different spheres of power in a way. Uh, that Paul will use, and we'll see that even in Galatians 5, where he uh, shows the polarity between the spirit and the flesh. Um, and so in the Messiah is how Paul understands the church and the churches, that they are in the Messiah. But it's also way bigger than that. Uh, you know, Paul, he sees creation as in the Messiah. Um, in verse 16 of Colossians 1, he says, in him or in or by him, we could translate that, but it's literally in him, in him. In him, all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, right? So all things have been created in him, through him and for him, right? So in Christo, the whole creation has come into being. And not only that, that in him, in Christo, all things have been held together, right? So all of creation has not only come into being in Christo, but is sustained in being in Christo. That is so huge for Paul. So creation, in a sense, is in Christo. Um, and even human existence is in Christo. Uh, Acts 17, 28, Paul would say, in him... We live, move, and have our being or exist, right? So it's in Christo is our very life and our activity and our uh, very existence is derived from in Christo. Um, there's also a sense in which Paul uses in Christo um, in terms of God's new activity in the world. So not simply just God's creation and providence and sustaining of creation, in Christ, but um, God's revelation, um, God's self-disclosure, God's redemption, um, God's salvation, it comes in Christ, that God's definitive action 
to disclose himself and to redeem his people and the creation takes place in Christo. Uh, and we benefit from that. We understand God's revelation and we appropriate his work also in Christo, right? So you have this deep concept there going on with um, Christ is God who became man and also the man who is God. And in him, God and man are united, right? In his one person. And so in Christo, we can't just think of God or of man, we think of God-man, because Christ is the God-man. And so in him, God has revealed himself to man, and in him, man has been reconciled to God. And so en Christo is huge for understanding that. It's the heart of our understanding of union, our understanding of salvation, because in Christo, our humanity has been united with divinity. And in him, in his one person, our salvation is complete and assured. Um, that's why Jesus doesn't just say, I will show you the way. I will make a way. I will teach the way. Those are all true. He says, I am the way because salvation is not just something he does or something he works out for us. It's something that he embodies. He embodies our salvation as the way. The way to the father is in and through him. And we are redeemed in him. We are reconciled in him. We are saved in him. We are made righteous in him. We are brought before the face of the Father, holy and blameless in him. And so we need to start believing the gospel, live out of that reality that in Christo, we have been uh, set right with God and that we are now living out of this new identity that is derived from in Christo, not in ourself. Um, so you have a creation sense of in Christ. You have a redemptive sense of in Christ. You also have a relational sense, meaning it's in Christ that we participate in and that we share in all that he is and all that he has by faith and by the cooperation of our will. That it's in Christ that by faith in the surrendering and submission of our will to Jesus that we share in God's life, that we participate in God's mission for the world, that we become the sphere of the Holy Trinity on earth, right? And so that's how Paul sees the church. The church in Christ is the place in which God's presence uh, dwells on earth. That it's the place in which if people want to encounter God revealed in Christ, they come through the church. And it's through the church that God extends his mission into the world and God reveals himself to the world as a light to the nations. Um, as Jesus says that he's the light of the world, and then he also says that you are the light of the world. Um, and so we see all of those uh, senses in Christ. So all of that to say, this particular verse is not super deep theologically, but it is the first time it comes up in Galatians. So I just want to hit on that. And you start to see how deep this in Christ is. And if we focus on that, understand that, we start to begin to see all of Paul's theology works itself out from union, works itself out from his understanding of what it means, what in Christ means. Um, here he says that, um, that it's the churches in Christ, right? It's the plural churches in Christ. So you see a diversity and a unity that, the, that Christ is the head of all things given to the church and the church is united. The churches are united in Christ, right? We may be divided, um, in our minds or even on earth, but in Christ, we are united. Uh, we are held together in him. Um, okay, so you see a lot of that in Christ. Another point to make too, um, this phrase in Christ um, perhaps was associated with the early teaching of the fathers that God in Christ has become all that we are in order that in Christ, we might become all that he is, right? And so this takes place in Christ, in the God-man, right? Um, we are lifted up to God and God comes down to us in Christ. And so he becomes all that we are in order that in him, we might become all that he is. Um, okay, so that's that, there's a lot there in Christ. It's very deep. Verse 23, Paul says, Then they kept hearing, Right, Only they kept hearing that he who once persecuted us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy. Okay, So you, this is what the churches are hearing. Right, So and again, he, he talked about how 
Um, his former manner of life you have heard, right? So most likely people heard about Saul of Tarsus and they kept hearing about Saul of Tarsus, especially after he encountered Jesus and was radically transformed. They kept hearing that the guy who used to persecute us and destroy our church and try to stamp out our way of life as followers of Jesus, guess what? He, he got knocked off his horse. He encountered Jesus and all of a sudden now he's a preacher of our faith, right? So here you see a unity between the faith of the churches of Judea and the faith which Paul preaches, which is what is at stake in Galatians. The teachers are saying he preaches a different faith, right? But here he's affirming that even the churches in Judea at one point, because of his radical transformation, they are saying he's preaching our faith, which he wants to, because he tried to, he used to try to destroy it. Um, the verb uh, for persecute and destroy, these two verbs, Paul also uses, as we pointed out before, in verse 13, um, he used to persecute the church of God, trying to destroy it. Those two verbs are also only used um, in Acts chapter 9, which refers to Paul's, um, that is his personal story of his encounter with Jesus in Acts chapter 9, that he was persecuting the church of God and trying to destroy it. And what's interesting is when Paul encounters Jesus, in Acts 9, it says, while he was still breathing threats against the church, right? That Jesus, a light appears and he he hears this voice saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And then Paul responds with, who are you, Lord? Kyrios, which for the Jews was Yahweh, the Kyrios. Who are you, Lord? And then it says, I'm Jesus whom you are persecuting. Because if you persecute Jesus' people, you persecute him. And so in this encounter, Paul, then everything gets reoriented. Um, and you'll notice here his language. He who once persecuted us is now preaching the faith. He who once was a persecutor is now the preacher, right? And that means that this is the turning point of the ages from the present evil age to the new creation that took place in Paul's own experience. He who once was zealous for his ancestral customs, is now zealous for Jesus and is a slave of the Messiah. He who once used to destroy the church is now preaching this faith and building the church, right? You see this contrast between formerly and now, and it's a shift which speaks of Paul's transformation. It speaks of death and resurrection. It speaks how in Christ, the revelation of Jesus Christ, Paul encountered his end. Paul encountered his judgment. He encountered Jesus. Um, he encountered the end of his old life. He encountered also his new life. He encountered then his new and true purpose, his real identity in Christ. And so he was both undone and remade in his encounter with Christ and that is the beginning of his new work, that he who once persecuted is now the preacher, right? Um, he preached the faith. This term, the faith, will come up significantly a few other places in Galatia, but here it seems as if it's a synonym for the gospel. He preaches the faith, right? He preaches the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's the faith in which all of the churches of Judea held in common as well. Verse 24 it says that they were glorifying God in me. This, this could literally be rendered in me. And this phrase, en emoi, is the same as what is used in 2.20. Um, I've been crucified with Christ. Christ lives en emoi, en me. Um, what's interesting about this is that most likely Paul is echoing Isaiah 49, verse 3. It's uh, one, one of the passages in the latter half of Isaiah that speaks of the servant. And there's a lot of discussion of who this servant is. And uh, there's several servant songs in the latter half of Isaiah. And one of the main ones is the suffering servant of Isaiah 53. But here it says that you are my servant, Israel. So here it's identified with Israel. Sometimes it's a little bit more ambiguous of it's either a uh, Israel, or it's a representative of Israel, or it's a, someone who, you know, is associated with Israel. 
You are my servant Israel, in whom I will show my glory. You are my servant Israel, in whom I will show my glory. All right. So most likely Paul is referring here in Galatians to that verse. Um, and in, on into chapter 2, he may make some more allusions to Isaiah 49. They were glorifying God in me, right? Because of his transformation, because of his radical um, renewal of life, they began to glorify God in the apostle. St. John Chrysostom says this, See how accurately he observes the rule of his humility. He says not that they admired me, they applauded me, or were astonished at me, but he ascribes all to the divine grace by the words that they glorified God in me. And so that concludes this section of 118 to 24. Next time we will look at uh, 2, 1 through 10. See you then.